My name is Kira Westaway. I work at Macquarie University in the Department of Environmental Sciences. Um, I'm under the umbrella of environmental scientist, but I actually see myself as what we call a geochronologist. So um, I um, try to date um, the timing of um, when things died or when in climates and environments that have changed in the past. So I'm really inspired and engaged by explorers. So I'm really sort of inspired by people like, you know, the James Cameron of the National Geographic world, people who like to just get out there and explore and find new things, finding the first and the biggest and you know that's always been a, a kind of excitement for me. I love trying to address questions, big questions that haven't really been um, answered. People shy away from those big questions but I like to you know kind of address them and really um, go hard into trying to find an answer even if it you know takes my whole research career to find the answer. Those are the kind of big challenges that I like to face. Usually with science um, you go looking for one thing and you um, without you know without knowing you find something else it's that kind of unknown unknown you know there's things that you know you don't know and there's things that there are, that you don't even know you don't know and with The Hobbit it, it was one of those kind of unknown unknowns we had no idea that we were going to find what we find we were actually looking for evidence of modern humans in um, in Flores Island we'd found this cave Liambua it had a lot of potential because um, a priest called Verhoeven had dug um, there um, um, a few hundred years ago and he'd found all these Neolithic burials so he'd found a lot of evidence in that cave. It's an amazing cave, it's like you know, 16 metres of sediment. It's a real focus for the village, um, they used to have um, lessons in there from, um, from teachers who used to actually teach the, their class in there and so it's a real focus of the community but it had a lot of potential. So Professor Siono from um, Jakarta had done a little bit of research there and he dug down about three metres which is really as deep as you can safely go without any protection of the actual excavation itself. And he'd found a few interesting things, but he got to what he what we call a sterile level with, with no fossils. Um, so Professor Mike Morwood was leading the project at the time. He thought this cave had a lot of potential. And um, Professor Mike Morwood's all about um, going down as far as you can. Like he, he basically says, if you don't hit bedrock, you don't know what's really there. Do you know what I mean? So he went down and they actually did a grave digging course in Sydney, him and um, Professor Bert Roberts from Wollongong, they did a grave digging course in Sydney and they worked out how to what we call shore, which is putting the wood structures around the excavation to make it safe. So they went from the three metres that Professor Siona had done and, ma and managed to dig down another three or, or, or four metres and that's when we actually found the Hobbit. So it was all about um, just getting down a little bit deeper and obviously totally unexpected, did not know, had a clue what we'd found. At first we thought it was a child because it was very small, um, but then as we put pulled it out we realised that the wisdom teeth were not only erupted they were they were out and they were actually quite worn so there's no way this could have been a child and then we were like what on earth do we have here we go looking for modern humans and we find a new species of human which is often what happens with science you know you just don't know you've just got to kind of keep yourself open to this the unexpected. So with, with The Hobbit, Homo thuresiensis, we knew it was going to be controversial. We knew that it was going to be very tough to um, get scientists to accept that this was not only a new species of human, but the actual age range at, at which it was, it was found. So we knew it was going to be tough. So we knew with, with this kind of thing, you only really have one chance to nail it. You know, they, people are very unac you know, unaccepting and they're very critical and you have to really present a watertight case. So for me, me um, doing the chronology, we knew that one dating technique was not going to be enough to convince people of the age. So um, we collected sediments from um, around um, the, the, the skeleton um, for um, luminescence dating. We also collected um, burnt um, pieces of charcoal for radiocarbon dating. Um, and we also um, actually dated the, the bone, the fossil itself, using um, uranium series in a, in a kind of a modelled way to make sure that we could really incorporate what was going on in the case. So three or four dating techniques, we looked at the, the context, we looked at the, the climate in which they were living, we looked at the archaeological context because we didn't just find a skeleton on its own, we found it within what we call a living floor. So that floor you could see um, 
stone tools, you could see bone, um, you could see um, hearths where they'd been using fire, and they were all on one surface. I mean, we had excavators that were actually digging, actually cut the hands on some of the stone tools. They were still so sharp, you know, 50,000 years later, that it was almost like you could almost picture the hominids actually sitting there and eating and, um, you know, butchering the, the bones and, and cooking and, yeah, crazy experience to see that. So funny enough, um, when we do um, a lot of the dating, um, we do a technique called single grain, which is a um, machine behind me here. And rather than um, just take a group of grains and work out the age from um, those group of grains, we can actually now um, work out the age from one single grain. So we have a laser that we fire directly at one tiny little quartz grain, almost too small to see by the naked eye. Um, and we fire a laser at that grain and that grain can tell us its age. Now, because we do that for multiple grains, so 100 grains on each disc and we do multiple discs, we actually get some statistics. We actually get some data um, which we can actually look at. And from that, we can work out which grains were well bleached, so reset to zero before they entered the cave and were buried, and which grains um, actually had what we call a remnant dose. So they actually had um, a little bit of luminescence that was left over because they weren't properly bleached from the last time. And by analysing that data using statistical methods, um, certain models that we use, we can actually work out which grains are going to give us the optimum or the true burial age um, for that sediment. So originally when we, um, we did the dating, um, the ages came out for the Hobbit skeleton of about 18,000 years. So we were like really, wow, we've got this crazy piece uh, um, skeleton that has archaic features plus more modern features. And it was only around 18,000 years ago. How on earth are we going to explain this? Um, so we presented the data um, in what we had. Um, the most of the community accepted it, some didn't. Um, and then we did another 10 years of excavations after that. And then we realized that um, what we were actually looking at was um, the, the skeleton bones were actually eroding out of an older bank of sediment and the, the where we had ex where we excavated down they, the, the bones looked like they were being surrounded by this younger sediment. So we'd collected the sediment dating and we got this 18,000 year old age. It wasn't until we actually dated the, the fossils themselves. Obviously it's a, it's a halotype of a species so people are not keen to kind of use it for dating, you know. But we were mani managed to actually do some dating on the fossils themselves and realise that the fossils were actually more like 50 to 60,000. And then when we dated this older bank of sediment behind, we found this older unit that was about 50 to 60. So we actually changed our perspective on the dating mainly because you know with science you make an assessment or interpretation based on the data that you have if you get new data you are valid and allowed to actually then make a reinterpretation you just put your hand up and say do you know what based on what we had then we had that age but now we have this new information we are allowed to put our hand up and say actually we think it's actually this and this is how science progresses is when people make reinterpretations on things it's not like you make one interpretation it's set in stone for life there's always new interpretations that can come from a new analysis or new, new data so with um, single grain dating, we collect a lot of data, um, sometimes thousands and thousands of grains, each with their own um, signal measurement. Um, but it's quite surprising how many grains actually don't luminesce. So sometimes it can be as low as 5% of the grains actually give a luminescent signal. All the other grains don't give any signal at all. So we have to try and filter out the grains that don't give a signal. Um, and um, so we have a very stringent, what we call a cri uh, rejection criteria. And we kind of work through the data and reject the grains that, that don't give a, a, a true luminescent signal or, or anything that's going to um, cause a problem. And then we're left with what we call the accepted grains. And from those accepted grains um, we have to try and work out which grains um, on which end of the distribution are actually going to give us the ones that's closest to the true age and we run what we call a minimum age model um, through that data set and that just takes into uh, consideration the the age um, of the of each grain but also the error range so whenever we're looking at ages we never just look at what we call the median age so 20,000 we always look at the the range of that um, um, result so it'd be 20,000 plus or minus five that would be the actual error range that we look at so when we do run this model it incorporates all the error ranges and how precise or um, each um, result is and then from that we can actually um, look um, isolate the grains that we think have been the ones that most bleach which are most accurate for the age that we're trying to establish so I'm a really strong believer in that science is for everyone I don't believe that
that you know we are in this ivory tower and that the public can't um, communicate or connect with with this science. So I'm all about breaking down the barriers and making science acceptable, uh, accessible to everybody. And it's just about breaking down the jargon, um, luminescent stating. It's very very heavily jar jargonized. You know, and um, everything we talk about is is jargon. It's just about breaking it down and making it um, accessible to people. So for luminescence, I just talk about a light sensitive signal um, that is removed by daylight and that builds up during burial. It doesn't have to have all that ex excess jargon. It doesn't have to be over complicated for people to really understand. So um, I don't shy away from talking about luminescence because I think that the, your average general public can actually handle the science. Um, they just need to have it in an accessible format. So. Um, and I don't want to detract from the excitement. So I want people to be involved in the discovery and involved in the dating, but you've just got to be able to make it accessible. The Hobbit, we actually have um, three papers and they all were in nature. Um, I was kind of co-author on, on those three papers because um, um, I was contributing the dating, but there was a huge team of scientists that all worked on it. Um, we had um, geochronologists, we have archeologists, we have paleoanthropologists, all working together. And this is what I love about the science. It's very um, interdisciplinary. Um, there's, there's no barriers with disciplines everybody all kind of works together everyone is an expert in their own field and we all contribute the data to, to, to get the result that we want so it's a really huge team effort science to me is one of the most amazing fascinating challenging things I've ever done I mean luminescence dating is the hardest thing I've ever done in the whole of my life it's incredible I know people um, professors have been doing it for you know 40 years and they still say we're scratching the surface and our understanding so it's incredible it's it's challenging anyone that's interested in science I think it's the interest that's going to be the key because it's about curiosity it's about feeling curious about something and wanting to know the answer everything I do in science is driven by wanting to know the answer people say to me why do you do all this dating in China why do you go to Indonesia and, and go digging in caves it's because I want to know the answer it's not because I want to use the information and write papers and do all this it's I genuinely want to know when humans first arrived in Southeast Asia and I want to I mean yeah there is an element that I want to turn science on its head a little bit I like, you know, going against the accepted, you know, ideas. I don't like anything that's accepted. If people say, oh, modern humans didn't arrive um, in Southeast Asia until 45,000, I like to turn that on the head, you know, with my paper in Sumatra and push it right back to 73 to 63. You know, just try and put the cat amongst the pigeons, turn science over. People get a little bit complacent in science and they kind of say, this is our understanding and this is what we're going to stick with. But no, no, come up with something that completely changes that, you know, and that's a really exciting goal in science to try and turn the accepted on its head.